Hi, I'm retired NYPD Detective Vic Ferrari, and welcome to NYPD Through the Looking Glass, where you'll get unique insight into the New York City Police Department. Before we get started, I encourage you to check out my Amazon author page, where you can preview my books for free. They make great $10 reads and $2.99 ebook downloads, including my book, Grand Theft Auto, the NYPD's Auto Crime Division. Speaking of auto theft, today's guest has a fascinating past. Growing up in Queens, New York, Lou Ferrante began his criminal career as a car thief before moving on to hijacking trucks. The former Gambino crime family associate spent over eight years in prison before turning his life around and becoming a best-selling author. His works include Unlocked, The Life and Crimes of a Mafia Insider, Borgata, Rise of an Empire, A History of, a, of the American Mafia from his Borgata Trilogy, Tough Guy, a, mem a Memoir by Lou Ferrante, and Mob Rules, What the Mob Can Teach Legitimate Businessmen. Lou Ferrante's books are available on Amazon, and I'll post the link to his author page and website on this week's episode. I'd like to welcome today's guest, Lou Ferrante. Lou, how are you doing today? Very good, Vic. How are you? I'm doing great. Lou, if I told you 25 years ago that you'd be talking to an NYPD auto crime detective through a computer about criminal activity, you would have said I was crazy, and yet here we are today. I would have said you were out of your mind. <laughs> Out of your mind. I would have never talked to you again. I would have said, this guy belongs in a loony bin. There's no way. Yeah, so. <laughs> I just think it's crazy. funny, like, all these years later. It is funny. Yeah, I would have never. You couldn't have got me to believe that. A million dollars, I wouldn't have. If you gave me a million dollars to even entertain the story, I wouldn't have done it. Yeah. Lou, tell our listeners about yourself. Yeah, so like you said, I grew up in, in Queens. And uh, to speak to what your expertise was, which was auto crime, I started out as a car thief and uh, I chopped cars in chop shops. And, uh, and that sort of, I, you know, I wish I stuck with it because had I stuck with that, I would have made a lot of money. I would have continued to make a lot of money rather. And I would have never got all of the years I went to prison for, for hijacking, which was considered, you know, crime, a violent. So had I stuck with cars, it probably would have been the best thing. I was making good money with the cars. I would have made more and more money as I continued. Um, and you, you get a slap on the wrist. I mean, you do a few years. But, you, you know, you're not hurting anybody when you're stealing a car as long as the person wasn't in it. And we never carjacked. We would never take a car with someone in it. We took cars in the middle of the night when nobody was in them. Uh, and usually people had insurance. It was a nice enough car. They got insurance. It was an inconvenience. I'm not saying it wasn't a crime. I'm not saying it was victimless. Somebody woke up in the morning, couldn't get to work. Uh, had to go file with the insurance company, had to call the police, go sit in the precinct. But, uh, but you weren't, you know, sticking guns to people like I did when I was hijacking trucks and taking down heists. And uh, eventually I was even, even caught for, uh, I was indicted for armored car heists. What years were you active of stealing cars? Like from what time period? I would say the, uh, the mid to late 80s is when I was really, really hot with the cars through high school. And, uh, and, after high school, by the time high school was over, is when I started hijacking trucks. And even the hijacking trucks stem from my stealing cars because I was in an auto body shop. We would deal with auto body collision shops. They would give us orders. Uh, they would tell us an auto, just so your listeners understand, an auto body collision shop gets cars that are damaged. And if the car isn't totaled out, they're going to fix it. So if they have to fix the car, they need parts. If they have to go to GM for the parts, uh, Chrysler, and order the parts from the dealerships, from the dealers directly, you're paying top dollar. Even if, it, even if they're aftermarket parts, you're paying top dollar. Even if they're from junkyards, the parts, you're paying almost top dollar. Because um, the junkyards know what the parts go for if you got to buy them. So they're going to charge a few bucks for them. But if you go to a car thief, you're getting them a lot cheaper. And we would charge a lot cheaper for the car um, and if we got the right color, we got a little more money. Uh, so we would, and we would match the cars. So we would get the auto body collision shops knowing that let's say they're making 10,000 on a repair job. Um, let's say just for argument's sake, 5,000 of that is labor, 5,000 is parts, or sometimes it's probably more for the parts than the labor. Um, we could come in and just give them a car for a thousand bucks. You know, maybe if we if we pieced it out, maybe twenty five hundred. So you're saving money with us times how many cars you do per week, per month, per year. You could save a lot of money with us, which means you're making your bottom line is a lot bigger and you're making a lot of money. So I dealt with different auto body collision shops and I was in one one day and I realized that there were these huge like the shelf behind me is about the size of these big snap on and Matco toolboxes. 
inside the body shops. And I said, wow, look at this, look at this baby. What's this thing go for? I told the guy it was with, you know, and he goes, that's oh, a few thousand dollars, that box. And if you add up all the tools these guys have that are working here, he goes, it's you know, thousands and thousands of dollars. They, the truck comes once a week, sometimes every other day, depends, sometimes a couple of times a week, but they come regularly. And uh, the truck's probably got like $100,000 worth of goods on it. And I said, you want one? And, you know, that's when I jumped from stealing cars and chopping cars to hijacking trucks. That was the moment. And so it all started in a body shop while I was, you know, selling parts. And uh, that's sort of like then it, I took a, tra a different tra trajectory once I realized that I could make a lot more money. Uh, I could make in a moment, in literally moments, hijacking a truck with $100,000 worth of goods. Uh, you know, even if you got 20 cents on a dolly, you walked away with $20,000 in cash in an hour as opposed to how many cars I would have to steal and chop up to deliver them to these auto body collision shops to make that same amount of money. So I saw faster money uh, and, I, and I, I went that way. And that's what ended up getting me in all the trouble I eventually got in because of that. I had, like I said, had I stayed with the cars, I probably could have did it for a long time. Had I got oh, yeah. in trouble, get slapped on the wrist, the wrist, unless it's like your third or fourth time or fifth time, you know, you get a couple of years, if that, usually get probation. Um, nobody's coming after you. It's not violent. Uh, so usually you could get off easy. How, how many days a week were you guys out still? Like when you, before, before the hijacking, when you guys were just swiping cars, like how many days a week were you guys out looking and what hours were you out stealing? Just about every night. I mean, we, we, always, had, we, we always had a running list of cars we needed to get. So I would try to get out every night. And uh, eventually I went from the car thief to the guys who mobilized you know, a number of car thieves under me. So I would then give them, right. I might give them $100 a car knowing I'm making 1000 Um So, you know, it's easy for a guy, a kid who's out there stealing cars just to joyride. A lot of kids would just steal cars to do donuts, like it's the way I started. So if these kids are joyriding and they're stealing cars just to kind of go on a date tonight, hang out with the girl, do a couple of races, do a couple of uh, donuts in a parking lot, ditch the car and go home, I would say, why not make a few bucks? Here's the cause I need. And then I had car thieves then eventually supplying me with the cause. Uh, so it was a regular thing. You know, you went out every night um, on the weekends. You know, we would chop them during the day. Uh, and and on, at night, you know, during the week, we chopped them at night. We would do, in the, originally we would chop the cars. We would take apart the cars in like Casino Park, Cunningham Park, okay. different parks where we would drive in. There was paths all the time. We could look out. You know, you, you, it's in the woods. So you're in the middle of nowhere. You could basically just, you're, you're in there by yourself. It's nice and quiet. Uh, you'd see auto crime coming in. You know what I mean? Unless they're, they're going in with, there with camo gear dressed as like, you know, like a Navy SEAL operation, you're going to spot them coming in. So, and you could just then flee. Um, but eventually then the auto body collision shop guys, back before the days of 9-11, where you could open up, you could lease a building under a phony name. Um, I used to even just, I used to go do, I, I was charged with an army car in California where we flew down under phony names. The FBI hauled us in. I was charged with that eventually, but we just book flights under phony names before 9-11. So back then, uh, one of the auto body shop guys would rent us a warehouse under a phony name, a lease, and then we'd fill up the warehouse with all these skeletons, deliver him all the parts, and just leave all the chassis behind when we cut out. And then, you know, somebody would find, the landlord would walk in after we were gone and find oh, yeah. this... Yeah, I mean, this, like, uh, you know, empty warehouse, and we were gone already. Yeah. So, like, were you guys stealing after midnight or before midnight? Both, probably. Usually before. You know, I'm, I'm still, you know, I got to go to school tomorrow morning, right? Oh, you know, cool. in high school. You know, I graduated high school. I cheated my way through, but I did graduate high school. So if I tried to get it in earlier in the night, you know, come home and say, hi, mom, I was out with my friends, I, I would do that. You know, the weekends was different. You could be out all night. But uh, during the week, probably before midnight. The, the reason I ask is because I'm going to explain to you how an NYPD precinct works. Not auto crime, right? Mm -hmm. So in a NYPD precinct, you got three shifts, right? The days, 4 to 12 is midnight. Day shift is usually guys with time in, and they want to go home at 3 o'clock. They're not looking mm -hmm. to make any waves. They'll respond to a call, but they're not going balls to the wall. If there's an arrest made, you got six guys looking at each other. Well, I took the last one. They're not into it. For the most part, you know, I don't mean to disparage every cop doing the day shift. Four to 12s is the kids. It's the guys with no seniority in the job, early 20s, balls to the wall. They're driving 100 miles an hour. They often don't even know what they're looking for with stolen cars, right? Midnights. The midnight cops, that's big game hunting. 
Those are the guys that are sharp. They want to make overtime because when you make an arrest, you, you process the rest the following day. It goes into money. It goes into overtime. Also, on the 4 to 12, right, on the midnight, there's a thinning of the herd. So 4 to 12, you're driving around looking to swipe a car. There's a million other cars out there. On a midnight tour, mm-hmm. there's no one around. So say you guys steal a car, and you're following. Two cars are going together, and there's no other cars on the road. Where are those guys going? As soon as you get on them, boom, they go off to the races. So the midnight, with that thinning of the herd and the more sharp cops, mm-hmm. that's where the big chases would come on, and that's where we would make a lot of like big-time arrests with stolen cars on the midnights. And like you said, oh. you guys were paying the <laughs> ass parking those cars in the woods because they used to do that in the Bronx, yeah. and yeah. we would just... You'd see tire tracks, or sometimes you guys would remove the guardrail. You'd see, Mm -hmm. like, an unhooked guardrail, and they didn't put it back on, or it would fall off, and then we'd go, what's going on in here? Yeah, and, like, every other, every like, every couple of months, too, I could remember, like, we'd be playing handball on a handball court by Casino Park, and we'd see a couple of flatbeds pull up, NYPD, and they'd start dragging, you know, the carcasses out. And loading them onto the flatbed, and, and that—that's the first time we saw that wreck until we le- and since we left it, and we'd be hysterical laughing, you know. And the cops—I don't know if they were sharp enough to know that, you know, it was just—it was just the guys dragging it out. That detail, you know, if they're sharp enough to say, I wonder if those are the kids over there playing handball, smoking cigarettes, if they were the ones who did it. But maybe, maybe once in a while. But uh, it, it explains what you just said. Explains why we got away with it for so long. Because like if we were if we were closing up and you know getting most of the orders done before midnight. We had the right shift. I didn't even know that. That was just by chance, by luck. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because you got the sharper cops and there's less cars on the road. So say for argument's sake, like my old precinct up in Riverdale, we were getting killed back in the day. Because what they used to do is they would steal a lot of the four-door cars, tag them, and convert them into mm-hmm. gypsy cab. So if mm-hmm. we saw a couple of Lincolns or Cadillacs or Oldsmobile, big four-door cars mm-hmm. heading out of Riverdale. It's like you run the plate. And mm-hmm. all of a sudden, you look up, and they're off to the races. You're on to right. something. So, yeah, midnights were a lot easier to spot car yeah. thieves. Yeah. So even when I, even when after I got out of the car business, I stayed with the tag jobs uh, to, to a certain extent because I would tag my own cars. You know, I, I would go. Oh, you did it yourself? Say, Believe it or not, I would say, well, I had a friend of mine who was really good at it. He used to get the GM rivets, and we used to pop the windshield out, uh, take out the dashboard, and then we would – there was a little, you know, the little tag in the windshield, under the windshield rather, but in front of the dashboard. Let's say a Cadillac. Uh, you take that out. You pop the, ri- you know, you, you pop the rivets out, and then we had the right rivets to put back in, and uh, and then you crazy glue it, believe it or not, and then you were good. We might have did the door panel. That was it. And then, you know, for auto crime, if a guy like you pulled us over, you would check the rest of the numbers. We'd be busted. But if an average cop pulled us over at yeah. a light. He's checking the VIN in the front, and you know you're on. You, you get your ticket for whatever you might have did, and you're on your way. So you know they wouldn't even open the door and look at the door. Usually they just put the flashlight on the VIN. If it was at night, they make sure that it adds up to the Reggie, and you're good. So a guy like you pulls us over. You might have said, "Pop the hood." We knew we were dead. It's time to run. <laughs> right, you know, right. What, what are you going to do? Right, where, where are you going? But, but you know, so that's sort of like. But we used to do it all the time. We would buy. Uh, a clean title because you couldn't do it with a salvage title because a salvage title you had to run through motor vehicle so we would get a clean titled car and then we would go out and try to even match the color but if we couldn't then you could go to motor vehicle as long as it's a clean title and say or just mail it in and say I changed the paint I had the car painted and you were all right usually they didn't get you um, we got a little uh, crazy once in a while I remember um, there was an instance where I was driving an Eldorado it was like 79 tags with an 84 Eldorado because it's the same body style between those years. I, forgive me if I have the years slightly off. Right, but right, 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 right. Of years. course. And uh, so I did it. I, I think I bought, uh, I think it was a 79. I bought a Rex 79, tagged it with an 84, brand new Barretts. And uh, <laughs> when I went to sell it, I think the guy noticed in, you know, I was selling it at a, a used, uh, I don't know if you remember on Queens Boulevard, they used to have all of those used yeah, cars. Yeah, oh, sure. Ships. So it was easy to sell cars to them. A lot of guys, you know, if you're selling a car to them for two grand that they could sell for eight, you know, they, they, they bought it. You know, they could flip it that day. And they, they didn't ask a lot of questions, even if they might have known. But one guy pulled in with this particular Eldorado and he, know, he said, pop the hood. Let me take a look at it. So I popped the hood and he noticed right away it was a different engine. And he says, why has this got this engine? I'm like, whoa, whoa, what's going on here? I says, not this car ain't for you. I closed the hood and took off. <laughs> you know? So, you know, it depends if you, if you got a sharp guy. But normally you sold it to somebody on the street and that you knew. could sell it to 
Yeah, and sometimes we went as far as if we sold a tag job to somebody on the street, we'd give them a few months to insure the car, you know, to get all their shit right, and then we'd steal it back and get rid of it. This way, you, you know, it couldn't get come back to you. You know, we kept the duplicate set of keys. You know, but usually, though, if we sold it, then it was done. You know, and then you could say, I bought it that way if they came back to you. But if there was some reason to be concerned, we would, we would steal it back and just get rid of it then. What Lou is explaining is a tag job is you go out and you either have a car that, that, that you get wrecked and you don't have comprehensive insurance on it. Or like Lou said, you, you get a car with a clean title that's a wreck. You take all the VIN numbers off with the identifying features. You go steal a similar car and then just mask it. And then you're good to go. And like Lou said, if they would sell it to a guy that they were afraid he was going to take it to the dealership. Well, nowadays, if you take it to the dealership and they plug it into the computer and the brain tells the mechanic, hey, this isn't a 2002, it's a 2007, mm -hmm. maybe we mm -hmm. should call the cops, which we used to get phone calls, believe it or not, mm -hmm. from, mm -hmm. from car dealerships when a car would turn up like that, depending. But uh, so how many, how many cars do you think you tagged in your career? I mean, a lot. You know, we, we were one time I was in Florida with a friend of mine and he had a Trans Am. And just to give you an idea how casual we were about this, he had a Trans Am and the Trans Am conked on us. The engine went and we, we you know, we, he used to beat the hell out of the car. So the engine goes. So I told him, look, let's go to a hardware store. I just need a couple of tools. We'll tag you another one and drive home. And that's basically we did that in Florida. So, you know, I mean, that's how easy it was. So, you know, we matched the color, tagged the car and drove home you know, 1200 miles on, on, uh, I-95 with a tag job. So, you know, it was like, it was, it was the easiest thing in the world to do. So, you know, we did a lot. And like I said, though, I would have done a lot more. This is, these are my, this is just my teens. Um, and then I continued the tags, like I said, now and then, if I wanted a car, uh, I bought a vet wreck one time, a convertible vet, uh, it needed, it was, it was hitting the ass. So I needed the clip. Uh, so, you know, stole the vet, my friend uh, who had the shop, he cut it in half and then put the new, you know, put the new ass on it. And that was easy. It wasn't a tag job. It was just, you know, right, right, a stolen right. half of a car. Out. We pieced it out. How many yeah, times did you say you got chased car. by like irate car owners or the cops? One, yeah, one, one big chase that, that comes to mind was we were young. I was a kid. I probably, I didn't have a license yet. So I used to go out with a friend of mine who did have a license uh, for a legitimate car. And we used his, he had a little uh, pickup truck and we used his pickup truck to go steal um, that night. I think it was a Fiero GT and we were stealing it. And then somebody threw shots and said, son of a bitch, let's get out of here. We, we got, we jumped in his truck and we took off and uh, he chased us. He got in that car. He was, he was an off duty cop. We found out um, he chased us and we, we were on Union Turnpike in Queens. And we, at some point or another, he, he was on our ass for like 10 minutes and we know he's armed, so we can't pull over. He could be hot-headed, take a shot at us and say, you know, they came at me first. You know, back then, police now stigmatized. So they're more like, they're more sensitive to pulling out their guns now, you know, because they've gotten a lot of heat from people who said that they're, they're all dirty and stuff. And they've gotten, over the last few years, they've gotten hell from the public. But back then, it was a little bit different. You, you know, I think a cop could, I, I actually saw one time when cops, I wasn't involved in this, but I saw when cops got off the Van Wick Expressway and it was um, the Van Wick and I can't remember the exit, but it, it was piled up at the exit. There was like the, the car thief couldn't get through or whoever was he could have robbed the bank for. I don't know who it was, but the guy who was just, who was fleeing from them couldn't get through because there was traffic at the light after he got off the exit. And I'll never forget, I was behind these cops who were chasing him and they, they literally got out of the car and just started all of them were firing at this car. And I'm going, son of a bitch, there's people at the light. You, can, you know, those bullets ain't just going to hit that one right, car. Right, right, you know, right. It was a different day and age. But so anyway, getting back to them, when we were together, I said, I don't know if this guy's going to throw shots at us again. He already fired his gun. So we ended up on Union Turnpike. There was a high divider. And once my friend who was sharp realized that he could get over the divider, but he couldn't, he just like came to a stop made a U-turn over the divider and we waved to him, you know, so, you know, like he couldn't get over it. He had a right, low Because the Fiero was low to the ground. It was low to the ground. He couldn't, and it was a high divider. So it was like, all right, that was it for him. So we got away. But, um, you know, things like that, you know, you're out there, you're doing it. You know, now I'd be rooting for the cops. I'd say, you know, somebody's car is getting stolen, you know, these effing thieves. But back then we didn't know that, you know, we were no, rooting I for know. ourselves. We didn't know any better. Yeah. Were you stealing cars when Lojack came on the scene? 
No, but I will tell you this. We, we were hijacking trucks when Lojack, Lojack came on the scene. And a couple of times we were able to, there was something one time buried in the dashboard of the truck. We, we yanked it out another time under the hood. But the technology was very new. So we knew we only had a, mount, a short amount of time once we took that truck. Uh, and usually we took it before it was reported because if we took the driver and we had the truck, then it's not going to be reported until obviously the driver, we let him go and then he goes free. So then by then we'd have the truck gone. And then usually then within a couple of hours, they'd pull up to wherever we ditched the truck. But it was the very beginning of Lojack. We, I laughed today with old friends of mine saying we could never get away with the things we got away with then. I mean, we would literally steal a truck now and be caught a block later. You know, I mean, with the with the technology they have today, that's that's assuming they don't 10, 10 people on the street don't iPhone video you stealing the truck. That's true too. You know, I mean, this is like it's a different world. So I don't even know how people get away with these crimes today. But we did all that before the advent of all this technology. But I do remember Lojack. I do remember saying, you know, when guys were explaining to me in the very beginning, even whether it was a tip or it was a give up, where a guy would give us his truck and then claim it was stolen. But whatever the case is, I remember guys trying to explain to me what low jack is, and I'm going, low jack? I'm a hijacker, hijack, low jack, I don't understand this shit. And I'm trying to figure it out, and then slowly but surely I got it, you know? And then, uh, yeah, there was there was equipment on, on some of the trucks where, you know, that we started, that was towards the end of my career of that. You brought something up that way. I was gonna ask you, because you're, you're a car guy, everybody in the neighborhood knows you're a car guy. People mm -hmm. will come to you that have a, a, a lease where they're over the mileage or they're behind in their payments on, on a car and they're like, Lou, make my car disappear. You know, it's called Vic, a give I up or an insurance job. Vic, I, had, I, come, I came home after eight and a half years in prison and a dear friend of mine, a relative of mine, I, I, I don't want to put that right, out right, there, right, right, right. Together, said, can you get rid of my car? I can't get out of the lease. And I said, I'm straight. I'm done. I'm done. I, I, I'm done with crime. So, yeah, but we did that all the time with people. There was a mailman, my, my own mailman, okay? My own mailman asked me, he goes, can you get rid of the car? You know, so, I mean, you know, you got, it happens to people. Back then, just to be understanding of, because I'm understanding of the, of the guys on the, like a mailman, he's busting his ass. He breaks his balls. You know, by the time you pay your mortgage, your car payment, uh, your kids' bills, what do you got left? You know, you, you, you split a slice of dinner, a slice of pizza for dinner. People don't make tons of money. It's hard back then in my neighborhood. I don't know what mailmen make now, but back then you struggled. You know, you're making, you're busting your ass for a regular paycheck and it goes quick. And so if you get in over your head with something, what are you going to do? And also, also too, a lot of times guys who ask me for parts in my neighborhood were legitimate people. They, you know, they might even know my father, my uncle, but they, they don't want me to, you know, they know that this is between us. They wouldn't want right. me to tell my father or my uncle. They'd be embarrassed, but they might say, my battery went. You got any batteries laying around? Now, they know that I'm not good here. They know that I'm not, you know, I don't own a, a Napa. The battery's coming out of a car, right? So I would say, sure, I got a battery for you. I, got, I just took a brand new car. Let me give it to you. So, you know, if you could save $100 on a battery, now it's like 300 right, for a battery. But back then, it was probably $100, $75, $80 for a battery. I'd give it to you for nothing. So, you know, I mean, that was like that was like regular people a lot of times did come to you. You know, or a guy would say, my tires are bald. I'd see the guy driving around on, on bald tires going, you got three kids in the car. You, you can't even go out in the rain. You're going to skid right through a light and kill everybody. And he'd say, Lou, I, don't, I can't afford tires. You know, they're $100 a piece. Now they're 200 or 300 a piece. But they're $100 a piece. Give me the size. Write it down on a piece of paper. I'll get you the tires. You know, so you were able to do that for people. And when you did that for people, they're regular people. They're the same people who hang around with cops. You know, or some, <laughs> sometimes it is a cop. Sometimes it is a cop. Oh. It's not auto crime, but maybe it's a cop who's like, you know what? At the end of the day, it's just tires. What's the difference? Then we came across them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we I mean, cops yeah. That I, doing for the most part, 99% of the cops are clean, especially today. You know, there's too much scrutiny. There's too much IAD on top of cops today. It's hard for them to be dirty. But I'm going back 30 years where, you know, cops, too, grew up in the same neighborhoods we grew up in. Oh, yeah. They knew us. Yeah, I mean, look, you, you're in, you're, you just went to uh, the academy. You know, you spent six months with these guys. You know us for, for 25 years, you know, or 20 years when I'm a kid or 17 years. You know me since I'm born. 
whatever age I was at the time. So, you, you know, I mean, you could you could deal with a guy like that where he's your friend first before he got it, he ever thought about getting a badge. We're talking about insurance jobs. Let's just tell you a quick story. Our Queen's office puts up a pole camera on some junkyard somewhere, and they're watching cars go in, mm-hmm. and they're never coming out. Mm-hmm. So they know they're give-ups. They're insurance mm-hmm. jobs, right? And they're reading the plates as they're going in. So the car goes into this junkyard on the 1st, and the 15th mm-hmm. it gets reported stolen, but it never comes out of the junkyard. Mm. So we get called in from the Bronx, and we're handed folders, go pick this guy up, go pick this guy up. And we have all the paperwork, the insurance claims they've made on these cars and everything. So I'll never forget this. They send us out to some address in Howard Beach, which Mm -hmm. is like the mob capital of the world. And uh, we knock on the door. Mob guy comes downstairs, and he looks at us. He goes, state or federal? We go, state. He goes, all right. He goes, all right, let, <laughs> come on in. Let me get my robe. Yeah, he's in his robe. He goes, all right, yeah, yeah. come on, right? We go, it's not for you. Goes, what? We go, your wife filed the claim. He goes, oh, fuck. Uh, yeah. He goes, give me a second. Yeah. He goes upstairs. The wife comes down. If looks could kill, the way she was looking at him for you put my name on this shit, yeah. and now I got to get arrested and take the pinch, yeah. right? Yeah. So we wound up arresting the wife. And taking mm-hmm. her out in handcuffs. And, I mean, mm-hmm. he was cool about it because I, he put her in the mix. But you knew yeah. when she got home that night, there was going to be fucking hell to pay. Yeah, yeah. He probably assured her, look, it's just a bullshit pinch. But but still, you still got your wife in handcuffs. <laughs> Who wants to go yeah. to Queen Central Booking or Brooklyn Central Booking? Yeah, in the tombs with some other, yeah, with some, some, you know, a bunch of women who've been there a thousand times. And, yeah, totally get it. Of, of, of all, the, I mean, before you went away... How many times did you get arrested? Uh, so I, everything came down at once. So I was running wild for a long time. The most so you I didn't ever take got, like little bullshit arrests here and there? Well, I, got, I went into the precinct one time, 109th Precinct. NYB, NYPD picked me up for an assault. Um, they said I hit a guy with a baseball bat, almost took his head off. The guy was in a coma for a week. Um, got out. They picked me up. I went in. Uh, I'll never forget. I went into the lineup. With a, I was, they grabbed cops. 109 yeah. priests, they grabbed a bunch of cops to put in the lineup with me. And I remember um, when we got in, I went in with a lawyer. I paid a lawyer to, for the day. And uh, I said, do me a favor, come in. You know, I don't know I don't know how this works. It was the first time I was in a lineup. And uh, we go in, and the cops, they put, they put a bunch of cops in with me, like three or four cops. And they all had, like, uh, I might have had a blue shirt on, and they all had, like, white shirts or vice versa. They all had blue, I had white so it was like, which one doesn't belong, right? It was like a dead giveaway. So my lawyer starts screaming, and uh, he goes, what's going on here? He goes, this is so obvious. He goes, the one guy who has the different shirt on. So they said, look, go get a sheet. There's some painting cloths. They were painting one wing at 109th at the time. So they said, go get one of those painting uh, drop cloths and bring it in here. The cops and the kid will hold it up to their well, necks. Not. So we all held the drop cloth up to our necks, and I remember one of the cops next to me was a comedian. He elbowed me, and he said, Hey, kid, would you hit this guy in bed? So it was hilarious, you know? Like, in other words, they got to ID me with a sheet up to my neck. So it was kind of funny, you know? So I said, no. I, says, I said, I didn't hit him. So anyway, the, the cops then were really cool. The guy didn't pick me. And uh, and the cops were like, you know, we know you did it, but, you know, watch yourself out there, Ferrante. You know, they were really cool, the cops, 109th back then. It was a little bit of a different world, like I said. But anyway, I beat the lineup. So now and then, you know, you got that, oh, that actually, that, Okay, my friend's truck, just to rewind to the story where we the, the, uh, the, the cop followed us. That was my friend's truck. It was a legitimate truck. It was the first car we were stealing that night. We reported that truck stolen that night, and we ditched it on the LIE. And we went to the 109th Precinct, reported it stolen. That truck, that cop came to him and my house the next day. And apparently, I said, how'd they end up in my house? But apparently he, he questioned kids in the neighborhood and they said they hang out together, those two. And so they went to his house and my house. And it's, so I wake up in the morning, there's cops on my porch. So I says, look, my friend's car got stolen last night. I had nothing to do with it. I don't know what you're talking about. You know, he goes, we can't prove it, but we're watching you. I said, whatever. So they left, you know, and they couldn't prove it. And then sure enough, my mother rest in peace. She's coming home from work. And she says, oh, we found your friend's truck on the LIE. She was all excited. I says, you did? You know, we didn't want to find it just yet. Right, right. So You're done with it. Yeah, but anyway, so oh, thanks, mom. You know, but uh, P.S. 
there was a few incidents now, but really when the shit hit, hit the fan was years later. I was hijacking, I was doing heists, I was doing army cars and every other thing you could think of. And uh, at some point or another, what happened was my fence was in Manhattan. And my fence was one of the biggest fences probably in the world. 47th Street, Manhattan was like the biggest concentration of gold and diamonds in the Diamond world. Diamond District. Diamond District. And everything went through there. Well, there was another, I think there was another one in lower, lower Manhattan, but this was 47th, obviously, the Diamond District. And um, everything went through there, all big heists. Whether it be jewels, diamonds, gold, or anything else he would take from us. Truckloads of anything. And at some point or another, he went bad. And when he went bad, he unloaded, tell the feds everything that I did, that I brought him. And that's when the feds were on to me and my crew. And then they started putting a lot of pressure on us. Eventually, I was indicted by the Secret Service. I was indicted by the Nassau County Organized Crime Task Force. And I was indicted by the FBI. So I had three cases at once. Then I had a superseding indictment. So it was like four cases at once. And, uh, you know, here I am, I'm facing life in prison. Uh, I refused to snitch. I wasn't, you know, it wasn't in me. I said, I'm, whatever happens, happens. And uh, my co-defendant stood up too. And we all faced life together. And we fought our cases for three years in Brooklyn Detention Center, MDC Brooklyn. And we stood together the whole time. And eventually we, uh, there was four of us made bail. So four of us stayed in. Uh, but all of that original eight, other than one guy who went bad in the beginning and another guy went into the witness protection program. Besides those, the original eight I was with on the indictment that stood up, stood up to the end. And um, I got eventually, they, I didn't know, they were offering us 20 years, take it or leave it. So as opposed to, if you want to not take a gamble and do life, you could take the 20. So 20 is a long time in the Fed. You got to do like 18 years, I think 85% of the time. Mm -hmm. So we were like, all right, we keep fighting. And I hired the best attorneys money could buy. I had William Kunstler. I had Barry Slotnick in the very beginning. Uh, Heavy headers. Yeah, he came off my case. Uh, so I went through seven attorneys in the beginning. And uh, I helped pay for some of my co-defendants to help them. And at some point or another, they offered me 13. They said, if Ferrante takes 13, then we'll give his co-defendants 10, 9, 8, 7, 6 down the line. Uh, but it's got to be a global plea. All these guys got to take the plea together. So we talked about it. And my my co-defendant said, look, we want to take it. So I said, fine. So I took 13. And um, it was a combination. My first case I blew, the Secret Service case and this case. So it was a combination, 13. And uh, so I took the plea. I went on my way. And, uh, and then later on, I reversed the plea on a technicality. I was in jail six and a half years and I reversed the, the plea. On a technicality, the plea allocution, the judge made mistakes at the, on the plea allocution. And so I was guilty and it wasn't like, you know, I reversed uh, a conviction by a jury, but the judge did make a couple of different errors. I filed it with the Second Circuit Court of Appeals and I won the case. I won it. They vacated the sentence. I went back and they wanted me to plea again. And I said, no, I'm not pleading again because all my co-defendants are gone now. So I, they look like the Sopranos, you know, my co-defendants. I couldn't win a trial with them, but now I'm by myself. I'm alone. So I says, you know what? You know, all these things, a lot of the evidence rested on them. It wasn't even on me. A lot of the things, a lot of the testimony was against them, not me. So I says, I, I think I could beat them. So I try, I said, let's pick a jury. And at that point, we realized that the, the main snitch who went into the witness protection program had violated the program and he was thrown out of the program. So, and he had done that as we understood it before we even took the pleas. So they really never had a case against us. But I will say this looking back, it was the best thing that ever happened because had I never gone away, I would have never read books. I would have never taught myself how to write. I would have never educated myself. I, never, I would have never became the person I am today had I not had that time away. So had I beaten them and tried them and won, I would have went right back to the same stuff and I would have either, either been killed or, or eventually got life and wouldn't have been able to get out of it. So at some point or another, I looked back and said it was the best thing. I didn't know the guy was thrown out of the program and I took the plea. You're running around pulling off all these scores. I mean, you're into everything. You got to know at some point. And you, I, I've watched your other podcasts where you knew they're, they're coming for you. Mm -hmm. we, what was your mindset? Like, were you scared? Were you like, were you like reserved to, all right, you know what? I got to do my time. I mean, did you think about fleeing the country? I mean, because you would never, well, the reason I asked uh, how many arrests you took before, mm -hmm. you, you had a pretty successful career. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, they're going to hit you all. You're going to get hit in the balls all at once. Mm -hmm. So, like, what was the mindset? Mm -hmm. All of the above. It's great you asked those questions. They're really great questions because I, I experienced all of that. And when you're 
from the time the FBI subpoenaed me and I took the fifth to the time I was, I was snatched off the street and went away and never came home, left my car on the street um, and didn't come home for eight and a half years. In that period, there was a constant pressure from, from the FBI investigating me. And I knew I was going away for a long time. So one is I was resigned to my fate. I understood this was something I chose. It was not in me to try to get out of it by snitching. Uh, I made these decisions. Nobody put a gun in my hand. Nobody told me I had to do these things. Um, look, if you're in a car and you're with uh, your best friend and your best friend pulls up, he tells you, I got to go run into the ATM and get money out of the bank. And he goes in there instead and robs it. And he puts you out there like that. And you were to tell on him. I would say, you know what? He betrayed you. So, you know, he can't complain that you're betraying him. You're a legitimate citizen. You got hood, you know, you got, you know, kind of like Shanghai into this. Whereas I made my decisions. It's like if you're pulling up to a bank and you know you're robbing it and you're with your friends, I made this decision. Shame, you know, shame on who, shame on anyone who tries to say now when you're caught, I want to try to put this on my friends and get out of it. So, you know, I I felt that I was resigned to my fate. I got to go away. I know that. I may have to go away for the rest of my life. That's what they're threatening me with. I understand that. Um, and so be it. Uh, it did cross my mind, like you said, leaving the country. At one point or another, I did think about leaving the country or going on the lam and being done with it. And I, I thought about that and I said, they're never... My mother died in my arms when I was young, which is a lot of the reason why I didn't care anymore. And I, so what? I got to go away for life. My mother lived her life as best as she could, and she, she melted away in my arms, you know, from cancer and died at 47. So who cares? So part of that was my mindset at the time. But why I didn't flee the country was my father, and I had friends, believe it or not, from the Sicilian mob in the Gambino family's Sicilian wing, who says, you go to Sicily, we'll keep you over there, you stay in Palermo, you know, that. and I said, they'll never leave my father alone. And if they're going to torture my father, what good is it for me that I escaped this hell and I escape this pressure, if they're just going to shift the pressure to my father, you know, because they're going to never leave him alone saying, where's your son? So at some point or another, I said, that's not for me either. I'd rather be able to be in jail and they leave my father alone. And he goes about his life and lives his life, um, you know, as best he can. So I, I they, all these different things did cross my mind. But I was I, at some point or another, when they started offering people, the FBI did, they were constantly questioning people around me, men and women. Family it's getting back everybody. to you. Yeah, to get back to me. So they were all telling me that they're getting all this pressure, all these people who I know. And at some point they were telling me, guys on the street were telling me, they're offering the witness protection program to anybody who cooperates against you. And when I heard that, I said, if the feds are willing to support some, some Shimonid for the rest of his life, you know, and send him five or $10,000 a month and relocate him and give him a new name, I'm dead. You know, if they're willing to use those resources to get me, I'm dead. So I, at that point, I knew I was going to go away for a long time, and I just resigned myself to it. I said, the, whenever they come, they come. Uh, and it was almost like a relief when they put you away. The first few nights in prison, it was the first time I lived without that pressure because, all right, I'm in a cell now. It's over. They got me. You know what I'm saying? It's Believe it or not, it was like almost like a, like a load being lifted off your back of constantly being hunted. You know, you're, you're in the fox hunt. You know, you're a yeah. fox and all these hounds are chasing you all the time. You know, the poor fox, at some point or another, the poor fox must just, you know, throw up its its four legs and say, enough. You know, so that's sort of how I was. So you go from, again, not really getting arrested a lot or doing any time, and now you get slammed and you're mm -hmm. in the federal system. The question I've always wanted to ask, are most guys in federal prison perfecting their craft that they can't wait mm -hmm. to scheme and get back into the mix when they get out or are there, or, or what percentage of guys are like, you know what, I'm done with this life. And then they get out and they don't know anything else and they get sucked right back in again. Yeah. So I have a, I have an example. There's a, there's a large percentage that does go back more so than goes clean. Mo most people do go okay. back and it's, it's, I think a demented mentality. I had it by the grace of God. I snapped out of it. And I swore that I'd rather live in a cardboard box than commit another crime. I would never, you know, I'd, I'd rather, if I ever needed money, if I ever needed the excitement again, just block it out. You know, just live in a law abiding life. But by then I had gone through a lot of psychological changes in that eight and a half years that I served. So I was different. But some people do go back. It's, it's most people. 
it's something that there's something wrong in the brain. I, have to, I hate to say it. I have, a, I have a dear friend of mine. I haven't figured this one out yet. There was really nothing wrong in his brain that I could see. He was extremely intelligent. Uh, I met him in federal prison and he was a young kid. They gave him 35 years and he was, he had served when I met him. He was, he had, he had a few years in, we got very close. And when I came home, he helped me reverse one of my cases. That technicality I found was with his help. He was a legal Eagle. And then he taught me law and I was able to study law and learn law. And I was able to help other convicts get out who had, who had relief coming from the courts. I'm not one to say nobody belongs in jail. Believe me, 99% of the people in jail belong in jail. There is a small percentage of innocent people who get railroaded, and that's a shame. Uh, we should have a better system that is able to discern more so, uh, uh, more accurately, who is innocent, but we don't care. A lot of prosecutors just want convictions, and they don't care who gets thrown in with it. But whatever the case is, he was guilty of these crimes. He was a kid, guilty of drug dealing, went away, got 35 years. He's away with me. After I came home from jail, I stuck with him. I would send his mother money to go uh, out to dinner. I felt bad for his mother and his kid. He had a kid before he knocked up a girl before he went away. I would send the, the mother money so she could take the kid to dinner and stuff, buy him sneakers. And I stayed with him for like 15 years. He finally gets out. Um, uh, during the Trump administration, they made some changes to the prison system. And they were able to, to the, uh, they were able to let out a lot of people who, who should have been serving more time but there was changes made where they said enough is enough for these people, which was a good thing. And they happened to let out a lot of people who were reformed, like that famous African-American woman. I can't remember her name, but she got out after serving like 20 something years, Marie Johnson or something, or I can't remember her name, but she, she deserved to be home. She's been doing good with her life. She's definitely a, a hero of a person, how she changed herself. Um, but he came home after 20 something years and so he didn't have to serve the full 35. He came home after 20 something years. And I told him, look, please, please, please. I hope your mind is in the right direction. There's no need to ever go back to that crap. And he said, no, he goes, this is no way am I ever going back. I will never, we will never even think about that. So he was doing well. He had a job. I don't want to say what the job he had, but he was working for a company and he was doing really well with the company. He bought a house. Uh, his mother died after a couple of years. He was home. His father died while he was in jail and his mother died while he was home. So it was, um, I was glad that he got to see his mother before she died, which was good. That was a blessing, at least. Um, so he was doing good. Uh, had a girlfriend, had a couple of cars he bought, and he was really hustling. And at some point or another, we texted each other now and then, how you doing? I'm good. Uh, we, we, we didn't see each other a lot. We only saw each other once in Miami, in Miami, Florida, where we got together. But we didn't see each other a lot. But we were always talking and communicating. We have busy lives. And uh, I, as, as I understood it, he was doing really well. And then one day he's not responding to my text. And then like a month goes by, maybe like a couple of months, after a couple of months, I started to get really concerned saying, you know, I know now, now and then we're busy and we don't respond to each other because we know we're, we're, we have busy lives, but it's been too long. And so I went on the computer. I knew that he was going to buy his son a business. Uh, and so I said, let me go see if that business was ever started. Maybe I could find the number to the business and try to track him down that way. Uh, cause he's not answering my text. And then, um, when I went online to try to find this, the new store, I found out that he was indicted for a major, major drug distribution network. Yeah. He's he selling tons of ecstasy, uh, had a stolen car ring. He was doing, um, he just went completely full blown after 20 something years in jail. And you say to yourself, you know, God almighty, why, you know, you, 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 I was, I've been confused since that moment. So, you know, it's literally sat there stunned as if I got news that a friend of mine died because I, that's how close we were. And I loved him like a brother. You changed your so life. I'm still, so you, I still haven't come to terms. Yeah. But Lou, you changed your life. So I'm you're figuring he's on the same page as you. And then when he pulls that, you're like, well, what the fuck? I just saw this guy. He seemed everything was legit. And now he gets thrown back into the mix. Yeah. Yeah. It, didn't, it, it still hasn't made sense to me. And I hope to eventually get in touch with him. I haven't, I stayed with him so long and I was so close with him that I haven't, I'm still at the point where I slightly feel betrayed, but I do love him yeah. as a friend. At some point I will reach out to him and say, what, what'd you do? What, what, what was on your mind? You know, because he was a good person. Uh, he just, the mind was, I think, you know, the mind is, uh, infected with a disease that, that sort of like, you know, for some of us, we're able to sort of, I guess, find a cure for the illness and some of us can't. And, and that he's one who couldn't, I don't know what the answer is other than that. I haven't figured it out. Yeah. And for people that think that like, you know, t 
tough guys going away to federal prison. I wanted to ask you some questions. Like, how often do murders occur in federal prison? Uh, in, it depends which federal prison. So if you're in a, if you're in a medium or a low security, hardly ever. It would have to be something that's done accidental or somebody has to be past their breaking point and they go postal. Um, but if you're in a maximum security prison like I was, then it happens. My very first day in Lewisburg Penitentiary in Pennsylvania, they, categor- they categorized me, they classify everybody after they're sentenced. And they, ca- they classified me as violent and dangerous. And with that classification, they classified me, uh, they categorized me as maximum security penitentiary. So whereas my co-defendants went to sort of medium security pr- prisons and had really committed the same crimes I did for whatever reason, I guess because they considered me sort of like the hub of the conspiracy slash the mastermind of the heist, etc. They sent me to the max, the pen, and they were a little, a little bit was a little bit was was vindictiveness because they were mad I didn't cooperate. Uh, so I think that that was a little bit of a punishment that you're going to go to the pen, go enjoy go enjoy your life with these animals because you're one of them. You are an animal just like these people. That's basically the message as I saw it. So I go to the pen, my very first day in Lewisburg Penitentiary. Uh, double homicide, Aryan Brotherhood hacks to death and guts two black Muslim inmates. Uh, it was I landed in the middle of a race war. I didn't know that. The race war probably claimed about six or eight lives back and forth, but my very, very first day in the general population, there was a double homicide. And Lewisburg is a federal penitentiary, so you would think, oh, the feds, you know, club club fed, it's nice, but not, not the pens. Not anymore. No, the pens, yeah, where guys are doing life. So, and there's a handful of them, Atlanta, Lompoc, uh, there's a few penitentiaries, Lewisburg, um, where, um, you know, the Leavenworth, where people are doing life for multiple, multiple life sentences. Sometimes they have nothing to lose. You know, if they think that you took their apple, you know, if they, they bring an apple out of the chow hole and put it in their locker and they think that you stole that apple, they'll run a piece of rusted steel through your heart. No problem. Because, you know, I'm serving 15 life sentences for 15 murders. You, you can only get one life out of me. So what's the difference if I get 16 life sentences for 16 murders? You know, there's nothing you could do to me anymore. The law has lost its power to inflict punishment on that person. So they really don't care. Right. So there's, it's lawless. So that's sort of like the penitentiary, um, the way it is. And when I was re- eventually sent down from the penitentiary, when my eventually after a year and a half or so, my, my classification dropped to a medium, then I, I went to a medium and it was a lot different. The most that happens there is, you know, a guy might clock you, you know, maybe take a fit, you know, cheap shot at you, punch you, maybe cut your arm with a, with a razor, you know, maybe cut your cheek, but he's not looking to run a piece of rusted steel through your heart or your head. Um, in Lewisburg, they run them through your skulls, you know, that there was, you know, as I understood it, one of the guy had a machete straight through his neck, you know, so you know, they were gutted by machetes. How, where do you get a machete in the prison? Well, they're made from all different types of things. The air ducts, uh, you know, they, they know how to make weapons in the pen. And as crazy as it might sound, Lewisburg Penitentiary at that time had a metal shop. And the metal shop made lockers. They, yeah, they made lockers, <laughs> they made bunks, and they made machetes. So, you know. How bad is the health care in federal prison? Uh, I heard a story where a guy went in for, he had something wrong with one leg and they took off the other leg. So, you know, I mean, yeah. So things happen like that. Yeah. Um, you know, you're getting, you're getting, I don't want to knock all the doctors because I'm sure there are pl- plenty of qualified doctors in the federal system. I'm positive. But sometimes you do get guys who aren't qualified maybe for whatever reason to get into a pro- top hospital. Uh, and, you know, they end up working for the federal government you know, at one of their prison facilities, their prison hospital facilities. Um, I don't think it would be a choice, you know, like a, a, a choice option for doctors to go, I want to work at a federal hospital, you know, where I just do prisoners, you know, like where they're chained to the bed and with handcuffs as I operate on them. I don't know if that's something doctors would choose or if, or if you get caught for like running, a, you know, an illegal abortion clinic and you end up there. I don't know. I don't know the case with, you know, how they end up there, but whatever the case is, um, you know, there are some qualified doctors and there are some, I under, as I understand it, who make major blunders and mistakes. Uh, a lot of times, though, if you're in a particular hospital, if it's not a prison slash hospital facility and you're in just a prison, then they usually then get the U.S. Marshals 
or, or, the, uh, or the prison facility, the prison uh, uh, staff will figure out how to get you to the hospital, a nearby hospital, a local hospital to be treated. But it, once again, that depends on your, your classification. If you're too dangerous, they might not want to bring you to like a municipal hospital in the area, you know, like a public hospital. In your opinion, what was the worst prison you were in? Lewisburg, hands down. That's really? where the murders were. Yeah, Lewisburg was where the murders are. And uh, when, you're in a, when you're in a penitentiary, I, I landed there. I had 13 years. So all the mob guys greeted me. Jimmy Coonan, who was the boss of the Westies, he greeted me. Oh, wow. He walked me around. Yeah, great guy. Walked me around the yard, introduced me to a lot of different people. And uh, there was a lot of good... Michael Sessa was a great guy. Michael Sessa, I believe, was railroaded for the Colombo War. Uh, he, he, oh, I know who you're talking about. Yeah, Michael's brother Carmine Sessa went Carmine sour. Carmine Sessa was the one that flipped. Yeah, he flipped, and then he asked Michael to come along. He says, look, I'll get you the deal, too. And Michael says, no, I'd rather serve life if that's if that's what I have to do. And, and he's been there for 30-something years. But they put Michael on him. I'm not, like I said, 99% of the people in prison belong there. And I'm sure Michael was guilty of other things. But the particular crime Michael was charged with, I was privy to his case. I spoke about it with him. And I'm whole, I'm I'm... I'm of the wholehearted belief that he was innocent of that crime. Um, so he doesn't belong in prison. They had a dirty FBI agent who, who uh, was working against them with, a, with an FBI informant. This all came out. It's not something I'm just saying. That particular FBI agent was tried for four homicides in state court, but they dismissed the case on a technicality. So whatever the case was, Michael Sessor, I believe, was should have, been, uh, should have been let out of prison a long time ago. But I did meet him in... Uh, in Lewisburg, I met Jimmy Coonan, like I said. Frankie Lesterino, who recently passed away, was a Lucchese guy. He was there. And uh, they basically, uh, you know, they introduced me to everybody. And they told me, look, when you're talking to these people, don't tell them you got 13 years. And I said, why? 13 years is a lot of time. That's not a not skid bit. <laughs> and they go, it's nothing for these guys. They'll be jealous of you. And you don't know who you're dealing with here. Don't tell them. A lot of these guys got more than 13 in, and they got a whole lifetime to go. So I would keep it to myself. I knew to keep quiet once they kind of clued me in. You know, don't tell nobody you got 13 years. I wouldn't talk to, to, to I wouldn't talk about my case with anybody. I didn't want them to know I only had 13 years. And now if you go to a medium and they hear 13 years, you're the big guy because they're like 13. Everybody's doing two or three. You got 13, you know, or a low. So, you know, there's a few guys that have 13 or more. Usually they're doing a lot less, five, six at most. Um, so, yeah, and the pen, pen's bad. My my last day in the pen, the the guard, the hack, came up to me and he says, hey, Ferrante, he goes, you want to lock in for the night? I said, why would I want to lock in for the night? I'm not a rat. And he goes, no, no, I just want to look, I'm looking out for you. He goes, a lot of times people get jealous the night before someone leaves, they get killed. I said, you got to be kidding me. Why would anybody want to kill? They're that jealous? He goes, they know that you might be, you know, on the street one day and they, they're just so jealous that they can't bear to live with that. And they'll kill you for that. And I said, no, I'll take my chances out here. But thank you. I appreciate, you know, you're looking out for me. Most of the guards, I have to say, I got along with most of the guards. There was a few that were real bastards. But most of the guards, and men and women, were, were decent people, go to work, work two shifts. By the time they go home, they go to sleep and come back. They're, they're like us. They're in there as much as we are. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like they're doing a life sentence just to yes. try to get to the retirement so, and they weren't bad. A lot of people, you know, I was in a state prison where you used to get like 50 pounds or 55 pounds of food sent into you like for the month and you could cook in the state prison, whereas you couldn't in the federal prison. Like, like, you know, you had a kitchen in the middle of the tier block and friends of mine would send me 70, 80 pounds, a hundred pounds. And the guards knew that I minded my own business. I was never in anybody else's business. I wasn't out to cause trouble. I kept to myself and they probably knew who I was a little bit from the street because there was a lot of newspaper articles back in the day from me and they would go, look, you got a hundred pounds here. And they'd look around and they'd go, go ahead, get out of here. And, and they would let me take, you know, where, whereas somebody else, they'd say you're over a pound, find out something you don't want in here and I'm taking it out if they knew you were a problem. So, you know, people are human. If they know you're not after, you know, you know, you're not a ball buster, you're not causing the place problems. Right. They look out for you. If you're, you're, you're a problem, you got 56 pounds, you better find a pound you got to take out and throw in the garbage. You know, so there's, there's good hacks, you know, that look. I got into a beef one time before I left state prison too where this guy was busting my chops in my cell. And he used to play his music really loud. And I used to read. And I couldn't get out of the cell. Usually, like, it's if you come to loggerheads with somebody, you know, you bump heads with somebody like that, 
and the guy, usually you make him leave. That's like, you know, the alpha thing to do is you, he's got to leave the cell, not you. He's got to go, not you. So I said, you know what? I don't need this shit. I'm, I'm, I don't have no ego. I, you know, let me try to get out of the guy's cell, go somewhere else. And, and just like, you know, so I went around and I'm going home one day, not long from now. I don't need a fight. So I said, right. let me go around. If there's anybody on the tier block that wants to swap with me. And everybody on the tier block said, I ain't living with that son of a bitch. No way. Sorry, you got stuck with him, but I ain't living with him. So nobody, nobody wanted to swap cells with me. So now I'm stuck with the guy. He keeps blasting his music in my ear. And one day I told him, I says, look, can you at least use the headphones you have. You got headphones in. I'll buy you better headphones if you want. At least put the headphones on. I can't read anymore like this. So he says, F you. F you. I like torturing you. I get a kick out of it. That was it. I lost it. So obviously, I, you know, you can only imagine what I did. I don't have to say it. Yeah. You know, you're in, it's like a steel cage match. You're in a cell. And then after I, I did that, I, you know, I was re ready to take my lumps. I just figured I'd go tell the hack, look, I had a beef with my cellmate. He's laying in there on the floor. Take me to the hole. So I went up there and told him exactly that. I told the, the, the hack. I said, look, cough me up, take me to the hole. I just had a beef. I couldn't get out of it. He goes, look, Ferrante, I know exactly what's going on. And he goes, he's going, you're not. I said, what? He says, he's going, you're not. Well, as it turned out. He was a pain in their ass too. He, not only that, not only was he a pain in their ass and they hated him, but I didn't know that there was a snitch. The tear block snitch was filling him in all along telling him they're having beefs in that cell. Ferrante's trying to get out of the cell, but he won't, you know, he can't get anybody to swap with him. As I understood it later on, I found out the jailhouse snitch was telling him everything. And the guy sort of like was waiting for this powder keg to blow. And, you know, so he knew I was innocent all along and, and they wanted to get rid of him too. Like you said, he was a pain in the ass even to the institution. So I ducked that one. But uh, I felt like if you're good, if you're good hearted and you try to avoid a problem and then it happens somehow and you can't avoid it. Yeah. You know, by then I had faith. I believe God looks out for you. And that's all that could explain that because I wasn't, you know, I wasn't. Uh, what are the odds? I got a jailhouse snitch that I didn't even know was a jailhouse snitch. It was in looking out for you. Yeah. Looking out for me all along. And I'm not a snitch. I got nothing to do with him. You know, we're not friends, but, uh, you know, I knew him. But, uh, yeah, it turned out that he looked out for me. Yeah. When you were active and running around, you rubbed elbows with mob royalty. I mean, it's just too many names to list. But the one that I'm fascinated with is you're really good friends with Genovese crime boss Vincent the Chin Giganti's daughter, Rita. And I, I just find that fascinating that as, as much of a character as her father was, and for those of you who don't know, I mean, the Chin ran the Genovese crime family with an iron fist for decades. Mm -hmm. He perpetuated this hoax that he was insane. He walked around in a bathrobe and a hat and slippers and mumbled to himself. But he was a mob statesman. And basically even John Gotti's guys were very leery of him because he was a mysterious character. The Genovese crime family or the West Side, as they're called, are very secretive. They play hide the boss. You never really know who, who's running the family. They, they're less likely to flip those guys. So you become friends with Rita. And um, at some point you find out that the chin sends out for her and says, I don't want a Gambino guy in my house. I mean, did that unnerve you? I was so, by the way, I'm I'm still friends with Rita 35 years later. She's a dear friend of mine. I love her. I love her with all my heart. Uh, I'll ask her if, actually if she wants to come on your show. She, you yeah, know, I'd she, love to talk so, to her. Yeah, she's great. Um, so Rita was tough like a father. And I'm going to say this, I'm going to, I think she was the closest clone to her father than all of the kids, all his kids. She was so much like him in so many ways. Um, not a criminal, obviously. No. Uh, obviously, she's a woman. She's not involved in the life. She's, but very, very sharp, very smart. Um, she's intuitive. You know, all of the things that he would have needed, but he used them in the wrong way to get to the top of that pyramid, right. you know, that food chain. She has in her, but she uses them in the right way. So she's very much like that. Um, she told me, yeah, you know, at, at some point or another, she knew that I was with, you know, I'm in Howe Beach almost every day. I'm in and out of Pete Gotti's house. John, John Gotti's oldest brother, Pete Gotti, who was a capo at the time, eventually became the boss of the family after John was gone. But uh, I was in and out of his house every day for the, for the better part of years. Years this went on. 
And Rita knew that. So I would stay at Rita's house, Chin's house, over the weekends. And um, Rita, Rita knew, but the father didn't know. So at some point, the father gets wind. And he goes ape shit. You know, he went ballistic. And he says, you know, this, he's, at, sort of has, he's, had this, he's having this cold war with John Gotti, mm -hmm. where apparently it came out that Chin, Chin asked Bobby Manor, one of his guys, to kill John. And then Bobby Manor was having a conversation with his guys, his hitmen or something, in a bathroom, in, in a restaurant or something, and the bathroom was bugged. So the FBI gets wind of it, and then they go Sounds tell John, it. look, the Chin, yeah, they said, look, Chin's, Chin's trying to clip you. Do you know that? And he says, no, I didn't know that. John played dumb. He says, no, he would never try to do that. I don't believe that anyway. But John knew it was true, obviously. John didn't want to give in to them that it was true. So they leave, and then John has this sort of like, John sends word to the chin, I'm hip to this. Be careful. You know, there's two bosses. Chin was definitely more richer, more powerful, but there's still two bosses of two families. For all intents and purposes, they're supposed to be equal. And John sends word sort of, as I understand it, look, watch your step. If, if something happens to me, there's going to be a war here. You know, they're not going to, my guys are going to retaliate. So whatever the case is, they sort of had this cold war going on. And then Chin learns that the guy who's in Pete Gotti's house all week is in his house all weekend. That was it. So he called Rita, and Rita, look, Rita was tough. Rita said, look, he's my friend. And, uh, you know, we didn't have any type. It wasn't like he could claim that I'm hitting on his daughter, I'm having, right. a, I'm having an affair. His, Rita's, Rita's a lesbian. Right. And, you know, I respected Rita's lifestyle my whole life. I don't care. It's, you know, you, know you, you could bring me all, hang out with all your girlfriends in front of me. What do I care? It's got nothing to do with me and her. Like, we didn't have a relationship, a romantic relationship. So I was... That was a little better that he doesn't think some guys like, you know, you know, who's nabbing right. my, my daughter, you know, like what's going on here. So that was good that we didn't have that relationship, but she was tough he, and he wants me out of the house. And she says, F you, you pick your friends, I'll pick mine. You know, I, I, you know, like there's no way I'm giving them up as my friend. So she was, she was tough and we stayed friends. I continued to visit, but I looked over my shoulder when I pull up and when I pull out. Because I didn't know when he was going to say, send somebody there and make sure that's the last time he ends up at my house. You know, you, you could get pulled over on the Palisades Parkway by a phony cop. And next thing you know, you're over the cliff into the Palisade, you know, over the Palisades Cliff into the Hudson River. Who knows? You know, I mean, who knows how these things could play out? So I was hip to that. Um, but I stayed her friend. And then when I went to jail, she stayed friends with me. I was also friends with Chin's wife, Olympia, who loved me. So Olympia continued to let me in her house. You know, she stuck by me. You know, they knew me as a person and they knew that I would never, ever betray, not even a pe where a piece of furniture was in that house. You know, I mean, although I'm, I'm with the Gaudis, the Gaudis would never put me in a position like that to go, you know, we want, they, and they would never, nobody would ever try to hurt the, the women, his, his daughter, his wife, or try to go to the house. So, and, and that's it. I would never hurt them. So they knew that. They knew that of me and they stuck by me all those years in prison. Uh, and I'm, like I said, I'm still friends with Rita to this day. I'll ask her if she wants to come on your show. She'll yeah, give you great absolutely. stories. Yeah, she's uh, a great person. I mean, knowing what I know about the chin, mm -hmm. he must have really loved his daughter that nothing happened to you. Because there's a lot yeah. of people that went bye-bye for a hell of a lot less that he even suspected of something. He was a no-chances kind of guy. Yeah, I think he knew. I think he knew that there was really nothing Rita could do or say to me that could hurt him, number one, right. you know, like for the most part. But the other thing was he did love his daughter. He loved his family. You know, Chin, I, heard, I read somewhere when I was doing my research, Chin, Chin was in jail years later, you know, when he, he right. died in jail. So, you know, he's in jail towards the end. And there was an inmate or a guard who said that he said to him, look, you know, you got to do what you got to do for your family, you know, meaning his blood family, not, not necessarily the Genovese family. But he goes, you got to do what you got to do for your family. And that's what life's about. You know, he was a man whose duty was to his family. He cared for his family. He loved his family. And in the beginning, he may have did things to give his family more. You know, maybe he made mistakes along the way. Maybe his, his mindset was twisted. Maybe not everybody agrees with the way he thinks. But he did love his family. And his daughter loved him. She adored him. She adored him. So maybe it is part of what you said. He loved his daughter. His daughter stuck up to him. By the way, too, he res his daughter has told me time and again, he respected courage. He'd walk all over you if you were weak. Like if his daughter caved and said, please don't hurt him, he'd walk all over you. He probably would have killed me. But the fact that she says no, absolutely not, and stuck up to him, 
That's what he respected. He respected Probably saw a little courage. of himself in there too. Definitely, definitely. One time, one time she told me a story before uh, he went away. They were having like a little bit of a family gathering around the table, and she started, you know, calling him out on certain things and was talking tough with him. And she says, all my brothers and sisters are kicking me under the table. Like, shut up. What are you doing? They're rolling their eyes at me. And she says, I don't know who's kicking me, but you better stop. I'm the only one who speaks up to him, and I'm not going to stop. You know, so she was tough. You know, like I said, I know Rita. She's tough, but she's loving. And she's a beautiful, loving, caring person. So I know, I know a side of Rita that not everybody ever knew or knows. And she's just a beautiful, warm-hearted, caring person. But she's tough. In other words, if you, you know, oh, yeah, yeah, she's tough. She's got his she's got his sort of like his his sort of like that that toughness in her, I think more so than any of the other siblings. And she now and then she'll say or do something that I'm like, it's like the, right out of right out of the chin's playbook. Like, you know, or you look like them, you know, the expression of the face. But but it's not in a bad way. In other words, you know what I'm saying? Just yeah, no, I understand general, what you read. Smart, yeah. I mean, is that true, though, that at one point, like as a goof, you put on his bathrobe and slippers? I mean, I, you know, I, I joked around if I was in the house. I made jokes with them. Yeah. Yeah. Can so, you, you know, imagine what that robe is worth? You know, I told her she's got a lot of the memorabilia. She should sell it. Yeah, I told, you know, she, she might one day. She'll you know, never you sell it. That's too, that means too much to her, I would imagine. Well, I mean, she but, could sell some of it. I don't know. Whatever the case you know is. Yeah, that would be worth? worth. That yeah. should be in a museum. I might have one. <laughs> I might have one. <laughs> oh my god. Yeah. Lou, tell us about your books and where our audience can find them. Oh great. So yeah, so the newest book, and I have happen to have it. Big plug for my own book. It's Borgata Rocky Vampire. Um this book took me uh the trilogy, which is completely written, took me seven years to write. Um I was commissioned to write it in Sicily by Lord George Weidenfeld one of the biggest publishers of the 20th century. He asked me to write a history of the mafia as we sat in Agrigento in Sicily. And uh, I did not know what I was getting into. I'm an avid reader. Ever since I went to prison, I began reading in prison. I read 18, 18 hours a day while I was in prison. Um, only, only, you know, distractions pulled me away from my books. But for the most part, since I came home, I've continued to read. This is one of my bookshelves behind me, but I have, you know, dozens of bookshelves all over the house. Um, and I love reading. So I taught myself how to write. And this particular book, this trilogy, took me seven years to write. It goes deep into mafia history. And also, too, what it does is it debunks a lot of myths. If you've always heard the same story for 50 years about Frank Costello or Albert Anastasio or Lucky Luciano, and I sensed right away that there was something wrong about this story because I lived the life and I know intuitively what could have happened and what could never have happened. Uh, time and again, I come across these stories and I break down for the reader why this could never have happened and what probably did happen. And I don't expect the reader to just have confidence in me because I say I lived a life, so I break it down in deductive thinking. And I'll say, look, pretend you're a gangster, you know, and, and you're right. hanging out with me, and this is how this is how this would have went down. This is probably why this could never have happened. So the reader starts to understand that world as I understand it. That's sort of what was my goal was. But I I don't continue to like, you know, it's not a teaching lesson. It's basically just uh an entertaining story about how the mob started. It's a little academic in the beginning, uh, if you're not into that stuff, on how the, the origins of the mafia sort of arose in Sicily in the late 18, 1800s. Um, that's in the beginning of the book. It's just about the first 30 pages. Then it gets into the intrigues, the blood and guts, Lucky Luciano, Albert Anastasia, Vito Genovese. Um, and actually, Rita's father, Chin, comes in at the very end of book one, Borgata, book one, cool. which is uh, Rise of Empire, because he shoots Frank Costello in the head. Right. And that sort of like ends, that's sort of towards the end of book one. Uh, and then book two, which will be out the end of this year, is Clash of Titans. And that's basically begins with the uh, Kennedy administration and how the Kennedys were the first really, uh, it was the first really concentrated attack on the mafia nationwide under Bobby Kennedy, right. who was the attorney general for his brother, President John F. Kennedy. And that's interesting how that pans out and uh, what the mob was up to during those times and uh, the, how they worked with the CIA to get rid of Castro. And then I believe they eventually worked with the CIA to confront the problem from the Kennedy administration, which the CIA didn't like either. Uh, they weren't happy with the Kennedys as well. Is Borgata Volume 2 available on pre-order yet? 
It is. I'm glad you asked that. Please Good. pre-order it. Uh, the more pre-orders. I'll put the link. I'm sorry. Yeah, if you put the yeah, link up. I'll put up, the link up. Yeah, that would be great, Vic. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's available on pre-order. If you like the first one, hopefully you pre-order the second, and you'll have it uh, before it comes out. Mm-hmm. What, what other books you got? Uh, so Mob Rules, What the Mafia Can Teach the Legitimate Businessman, was sort of like written, sort of like a friend of mine called me up and said, I think, you know, you got such great stories you've told me over the years, and if you take the mob and you do, you take away all the violence and you just use how savvy they are in business and write a book about it, I think it would sell. And I said, really? So you think so? So I, I put together, a, a, you know, a, 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 you know, something, a pitch for my agent and my agent loved it. And she goes, I think I could sell this right away. And she's usually hard on me. Usually I come to her with an idea and she goes, I can't sell that. No way. Not happening. And as soon as she heard this, she goes, I'll sell it in a minute. And she did. Uh, yeah. Good. So she sold that book to Penguin Portfolio. And okay. lo and behold, it became an international bestseller. It was translated into 20 languages and it continues to sell today, 10 years later. And uh, it's an international bestseller. I have, I have people who are in, you know, people who are at the very top levels of government, people at the very top levels of industry who have written me and saying, I live with this book on my bedside table. So that's really, really a nice compliment. That's why I think the book has done so well. You know, I stripped away all the violence and said, just imagine it without the violence. And I also use a lot of historical vignettes. So I'll tell you maybe how a mafioso did something and then how this could relate to corporate. And then also, too, I might give you um, a historical example of how maybe the king of England or, or, or the prime minister of England done, had done something very similar and it's sort of like all these three examples converge to give you the same lesson. And I did a lot of that. Also, too, like I'm, I'm a big fan of Plutarch. Plutarch's Lives is the ancient uh, Greco-Roman historian who would give you like the life of Alexander, the life of Caesar, uh, different lives. He would then show you their vices and their virtues and tell you what they did right, what they did wrong. I do the same thing throughout mob rules. I try to teach you, uh, you know, this, this, this mob boss did this wrong and ended up dead on the street in a pool of blood. This mob boss did it right and ended up dying of natural causes at the ripe old age of 85, you know, in his, in his, in his Long Island estate. So this is sort of like the differences, how people do things and, you know, the, the rewards and punishments that are attendant with those particular examples. So that's throughout mob rules as well. Um, I loved mob rules. It's, it's like I said, it's an international bestseller, but I do think Borgata Rise of Empire is my writing has sort of matured, matured to a different level and I think that will eventually be sort of like my biggest triumph to date, uh, Borgata, the Borgata trilogy. Um, but yeah, so those are the two main books. I also wrote a memoir that gives you sort of like a, uh, uh, an overview of like my life on the streets, what it was like to be in the trenches. I wasn't a high-ranking mafioso, but I was around all the biggest people. Of, What's of the name the of that day. book? Uh, that's Unlocked, The Life and Crimes of a Mafia Insider, and it's named Tough Guy in the UK uh, and throughout Europe. Uh, but it's the same memoir. It's sort of like uh, the, everything in there I was either charged with or investigated for, so it's all true crimes, but I had to obviously then retell them as best I could looking back. Um, so then I would sort of like, you know, give you a third of the book is uh, on the streets, what life was like on the streets when you're at the bottom, in the trenches, in the mob, doing a lot of the dirty work, hijacking trucks, sticking up on cars. You know, you're not like puffing on a cigar going, where's my money for the waste removal? You know, where's my money for the recycling? You know, that's that's a yeah, different different ball game. But uh, yeah, so I show you trench life in the mob. And then the second uh, third of it is uh, while the feds are investigating me, what that's like. And then the last part of it is prison, the experiences in prison, which people have told me I've never read anything even close to yours when it comes to your experiences in prison, how I convey them. People have told me they feel like they were in prison with me, which is a nice compliment. Uh, but yeah, for, so for the most part, that's the newest book is Borgata. I urge everyone to read it. Um, that's a trilogy. Uh, it goes from the mafia in 1860s Sicily up and through um, my own day and time in three volumes. And it goes all over the country. We go to Las Vegas. We go to Cuba when uh, Cuba isn't part of the country, but we go to Las Vegas. We go to Cuba when the mob built casinos in Havana. We go to Louisiana. We go to California. We're all over, the, all over the map in different places, New York, and it just shows you wherever the story takes me, uh, just like if you're writing a history about the Roman Empire 
and it may take you, the story may take you to, to Spain, or it may take you to Carthage, or it may take you to Alexandria. Wherever, wherever the story takes the Roman historian, he follows the story, or he or she follows the story. I did the same thing with Borgata. And Lou, all your books are available on Amazon? Yeah, they're all available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, anywhere books are sold. Um, and uh, I, hope you're, uh, I hope your listeners enjoy them. Uh, you know, it's, oh, I'm uh, sure they will. Do, do you do speaking engagements? I used to do a lot more. Um, I, may, I may start doing them again. You know, it depends if I'm invited uh, to a particular place. Yeah, people can feel free to, uh, to go to my website, louisferrante.com. And uh, drop me an email, yeah, if you want to have me, you know, for a speaking engagement. Um, if I'm able to do it, um, you know, I used to do a lot of corporate uh, engagements. Uh, I used to do entrepreneurs organization, world presidents organization, uh, young presidents organization, a lot of the corporate clubs throughout the world. Um, I've spoken at the Economist uh, uh, Summit. I've spoken at the Leonard Lauder, had the Global Entrepreneurs Summit in New York. I've spoken there. So I've spoken at really a lot of big platforms. Um, and I like doing them, but uh, it could be from big to small. If you have a small platform, people who have a business might want to bring me in for their, for their annual whatever, for their, for their workers or something. And yeah, happy to do them. Just contact me through the website if we could you know, negotiate, uh, you know, figure out if I could make it those days and you, know, you guys could afford to bring me in or whatever, we could do it. So if you want to get a hold of Louis Ferrante, check, go to his website, louisferrante.com, where you'll be able to book him for an engagement or if you've got a question or, you know, some type of business dealing. Go to Amazon, type in his name, Lou Ferrante, where he's a series of books will come up, including Borgata, uh, his second book, Borgata Trilly, uh, the second book, what's it called again? I apologize. Uh, the second one will be Clash of Titans, which is part of the Borgata Trilogy as well. And that book is available on Amazon pre-order. Lou, I'd like to thank you again for spending this time with us, and I will have your website and all your Amazon books linked to this page. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Vic. I appreciate you having me on, and keep doing the great work you're doing. Your podcast is awesome. Thank you. And as always, I'd like to thank everyone for tuning in, especially my friends in Sacramento, California, Oak Creek, Wisconsin, Barga, Michigan, Massapequa Park, New York, Brooklyn, New York, and, of course, Joe O. from North Belmore, Long Island. If you work in law enforcement or have an interesting criminal background and would like to be a guest on the show, please drop me a note on Twitter or Instagram, at VicFerrari50. If you enjoyed the content, check out my Amazon author page. Type in my name, Vic Ferrari Like the Car, where you can preview all my books for free, including the topic of today's conversation, Grand Theft Auto, the NYPD's Auto Crime Division. Thank you again for tuning in, and I'll have another episode out next week.